means lower spending on other things, other priorities, other, other things being equal, of course. In your report, you mention uh, in that the estimates include a $1.4 billion acquisition of shares in the Canada Growth Fund. And I'm sure Canadians would appreciate understanding what this Canada Growth Fund means and a $1.4 billion acquisition of shares. Is this $1.4 billion in addition to the $15 billion that was um, earmarked for this fund, or is, or is it simply a part of it? My understanding is that it is a part of it, um, but it's not something that we have done a report on. But my understanding at this point is that it's one part, it's, it's part of the $15 billion. Are you aware if this new Canada Growth Fund is going to be set up in a similar way to the Green Slush Fund? Uh, I'm not aware of the governance issues around the Canada Growth Fund, not yet. Okay, thank you. Another question I have for you is, um, in the Department of Public Works and Government Services estimates, there is a line, vote 1C, funding for a cybersecurity certification program for defense contracts. That was in budget 2023, it's 798,000. Um, dollars. Can you tell me, is this for defense contractors that are employed by the government? I, I don't know exactly the details of, of this, uh, this item. It's a bit of an interesting question given the witness we had here at committee last week who was the chief security officer for a company that was contracted by the government who who it would appear did no real work when it came to those security assessments. And so I'd be really interested to know if we're funding um, individuals within the public service or if this is supposed to help those external consultants actually check off a box when they're looking to procure contracts with the government. I think that's a question that would be better answered by the Deputy Minister at PSPC or the Minister, unfortunately. Thank you. And we have them Wednesday, so you can re-ask them. Mr. Uh, Jawari, please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Welcome uh, to our committee, uh, Mr. Jawari. It's good to have you and your team. Once again, thank you very much for the time that your team provided a couple of weeks ago uh, when we had a comprehensive review of the estimates. Uh, uh, main estimates as well as um, the subs and department plan as well as the result. And also we had an opportunity to talk about the great report that you put out on uh, March 5th on the economic and fiscal outlook. Thank you very much. Um, in, in that report, there were a lot of good news, and we actually promoted in, in, our, uh, in our social media. The report talked about the fact that um, uh, it is projected that the inflation will get to about 2%. Uh, we are on the right trajectory for the bank to be able to start uh, reducing the interest rate possibly as, as early as the second quarter of uh, this year and uh, the trajectory for the debt to GDP ratio was was decreasing. You also highlighted a number of facts around that what well, we need to watch. Uh, you, you, you indicated that the economic growth um, might be a bit sluggish and that could result into um, excess supply which will put a downward pressure on uh, prices, therefore helps with the inflation. Um, but you highlighted the increase on the debt service, and that's a substantial increase, hopefully, with, with, the, um, with, with the downward pressure, on, with the downing uh, of the interest rate, that will, that will get some, some, uh, some help. Where, where it was very interesting for me and where I wanted to, uh, to um, ask some questions was around the, the percentage of uh, debt, uh, sorry, the percentage of deficit to the GDP. You talked about the 0.8, uh, uh, projection of about 0.8%. So can, can you give me a sense how much this 0.8% would be and, um, and what do we need to do uh, when we talk about we want to eliminate a deficit? Uh, what some of the 170 measures uh, uh, on the 2023 budget that's been uh, that's been proposed need to to either be reduced or be eliminated. Uh, so, uh, thank you for doing a very good summary of our economic and fiscal outlook. I should probably borrow that. Um, 
the 0.8% of GDP that's supposed to be expected to be the deficit in 26, 27, that's about $25.1 billion. Uh, so that's 0.8% of GDP in 26, 27. When it comes to how the government could go back to balance if it wished to do so, it could, of course, reduce spending. It could reduce the speed at which spending increases. It could also choose to increase revenues. Uh, so there's multiple ways where or through which it could choose to return to balance. Um, cutting some specific budget measures is also a possibility. An extension, I understand. Um, some program may take longer, but w what would be the, let's say, top three program that if we want to get to that, uh, you know, zero deficit, we, government should or would be in a position to be able to cut? And that's a, a policy decision for which you, as parliamentarians, are better qualified than me to determine. So you're not going to walk into this trap. Okay, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I was trying to, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that for us to get to that balance uh, uh, budget and uh, zero uh, deficit, um, you either have to extend the time or you have to reduce or you have to cut. And what is it to cut? You're going to cut the $10 daycare program. Are you going to cut the uh, dental program? Are you going to cut uh, the, um, a, a, not, a lot of program that's been rolled out as part of that uh, um, those 170 measures that has uh, brought so much prosperity and has helped us to be able to, to recover so fast. But thank you very much. Um, I found the, the, the report, uh, the economic and fiscal outlook, very, very, very helpful. And, um, you know, I, I intend to promote that because I think that sends a very positive message. But you also fairly highlighted the areas that the Canadians should be watching. And uh, to me, that's great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shawari. Uh, Mr. Shearer, welcome back to OGO. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I was hoping that we could have a discussion about the looming carbon tax hike that the Prime Minister is planning for April 1st. Uh, you did a comprehensive study of the carbon tax, and uh, uh, but you not only looked at the direct cost, uh, you, you looked at the total cost. The On page three of the report, it says uh, household net cost of the federal fuel charge, fiscal and economic impacts. I'm sure there's lots of Canadians that are following this very closely because they know how high prices are and they're afraid of how high they're going to jump April 1st. But can you just explain what that means, fiscal and economic impacts? So the fiscal impact is the impact of paying the tax directly. For example, filling up the gas tank, uh, gas to heat the home. The indirect costs, so for example, if you buy a service or goods, there's an energy component embedded, plus the GST that's applied to that tax. So that's the fiscal cost. The government sends a check or a rebate. So the fiscal impact is the difference between what you pay, indirect and direct, minus the rebate. And on that front, 80%, we estimate 80% of households get more than what they pay. When we also include the economic impacts, that's taking into account the fact that some sectors will be negatively affected by the carbon tax. For example, the transportation sector, the oil and gas sector is an obvious example. They'll be presumably negatively affected by a carbon tax that progressively increases. So when we take also that into account, we find that households will have lower employment in some sectors, lower investment income, and we find that it's the opposite. Once you take into account the fiscal and economic impact, the changes in the economic fabric of the country, that uh, households are seeing a negative impact uh, from the carbon tax when including both the amounts that they pay, but also the economic, the economic impact on households. So, so in other words, the fiscal impacts are where the tax is applied directly. So when I see that on my fuel bill, when I fill up my car, if I see that on my heating bill, that's the, the, the direct cost. And the rebate was only built around capturing that cost. But what you're saying today is that all the other cascading effects of the carbon tax increase will have a cost to Canadians. Yes, there's an adjustment in the economy that's 
expected to take place by reducing our use of fossil fuels, and that will have impacts, certainly in the short term, while the economy adjusts, and that impacts increases costs, for example, of transportation companies, which presumably will have lower profits that they will redistribute less of to shareholders, for example. And, and higher costs that get passed on to consumers. So, so that's a factor, too, in the economic cost, too. It's the indirect kind of cascading effects as a trucker has to pay his share of the carbon tax. That, that has to be accounted for somewhere. So with either higher prices, as you say, either lower wages or, or lower uh, uh, profits back to shareholders. Okay. And with that in mind, the majority of Canadians, are, are, are the majority of Canadians better off or worse off even after you factor in the, the rebate? Well, once you factor in the rebate, but also the economic impacts, based on our modeling, the majority of households will see a, a negative impact as a result of the carbon tax. Okay. And you've broken down in, in this chart uh, what are called quintiles. But uh, the, the, for, for those that might not be familiar with that, with, with that word, that basically means you take incomes and you divide them into five groups from hi highest to lowest. Is, is that right? So the, from the highest is quintile one, and the highest... We can call them MPs, but we call them quintile five. That's okay. a joke. And I'm looking at this chart, and and even uh, even the third, like the middle quintile, the the third quintile, is a is a net loser, uh, in 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 the province. I'm just looking at uh, Alberta is uh, even even after you factor in the uh, the rebate, uh, the the net cost is in that middle quintile. That middle income earner is fourteen hundred and sixty dollars worse off. Uh, it's about a hundred, little over a hundred dollars a month. Uh, Saskatchewan, my home province, nine hundred twenty-nine dollars worse off, even after the rebate. Manitoba, thousand dollars worse off, even after the rebate. Ontario, twelve hundred dollars. Nova Scotia, eleven hundred dollars worse off, even after the, the the rebate. Prince Edward Island, eleven hundred and eighteen dollars. Newfoundland and Labrador, six hundred and eighty dollars. In most of these cases, we're talking about. Uh, an extra hundred dollars a month in costs, even after the rebate. Am I reading that correctly? These are averages, of course, and it varies across provinces depending on the exact or the particular economic conditions and um, industrial structure of each province uh, and jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you very much. That is our time. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sowen, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Giroux, just following up with this kind of line of questioning, um, some of the numbers that you quoted, does this include uh, any costs associated with, um, say, environmental damages, uh, forest fires, uh, impacts to the agricultural sector for shorter growing seasons, for example, or droughts or floods? Um, are there costs associated with that that are captured in those numbers you just suggested? Um, no, because they're very difficult to estimate in the short term, and we've made that point uh, quite often, but it's very difficult to determine which, which part of forest fires or natural disasters are due to climate change and which ones would occur normally anyways. So it's very difficult to determine these, these aspects, and they're unfortunately not included. We have tried, however, to estimate the cost of climate change over a longer period of time in another report. Uh, and these, this report is available, but it's very difficult to determine the impact in the short term of climate change. So it's a, what we have done is a horizon between now and 2030 for the carbon tax. It would be very difficult to determine the cost of climate change over such a, a short period of time, even though there are impacts that are known but difficult to measure. And how about in health? I mean, we can consider air pollution impacts, for example, um, or even the, the incidences of, uh, say, say Lyme disease exposure here in, in my part of the country. Uh, there, there are, of course, health impacts as well. Is there other costs associated with those that you can highlight for us? Well, there are, there are obviously costs. When we saw wildfires last year, it's obvious that people who, who are suffering from respiratory illnesses who were in these surroundings were suffering from the wildfires. And, but it's very difficult to estimate these costs, and that's in good part why we have not tried to estimate these. Another reason is that even if Canada was to emit zero greenhouse gas, um, there would still be climate change uh, because of what's happening, what would happen, continue to happen in other countries. So that's why it's very difficult to estimate the cost of climate change 
and put that in perspective with the the cost of acting on the climate. Do your calculations in 